ladies and gentlemen. Happy to be at CPDP again. Uh, I think there is no better day than today to discuss about the practical meaning of the data protection law in Europe. And this practical meaning uh, is uh, often and generally described by the enforcement uh, of these laws. We know very well that the law in the books does not change the world. What actually does it is the practical implementation. And on this day, five years ago, many of us has te have celebrated. We celebrated entry into force of the GDPR. Andrea, who is with us here, started to work as the chair of the European Data Protection Board, the body of the European Union, with the legal uh, entity that was supposed to harmonize the way this law is enforced. And uh, we have certainly gro seen growing enforcement of data protection rights, not only the data protection authorities, but also the courts are increasingly active in ensuring that the general data protection regulation is up applied. And the time of the judicial review, which uh, reached at the moment the biggest cases, are the moment uh, where we have to look back. So not only the anniversary, but also the fact that we are going to the uh, moment when we will use all the tools that were given for the enforcement, make us thinking, are we successful with it? Uh, we put the question like that a year ago as the European Data Protection Supervisor for the conference on future of data protection effective enforcement in a digital world. But actually, we started preparation to this conference already a year earlier. That triggered the discussion. The discussion which uh, was followed in the meeting of the data protection authorities in Vienna in the list of the obstacles uh, that uh, exist and that should be actually removed somehow from the European uh, horizon. And we heard the comments, we heard the complaints, we heard the, the commentaries on how, in practice, the implementation looked like. The EDPB has worked hard to promote effective cooperation of the data protection authorities, and the legislative intervention was anyway necessary. And that's why we are at the moment when the Commission is going to propose adjustments to the legal regime in Europe that will answer this wish list that was created by the uh, EDPB. And I somehow want to propose uh, to the discussion three questions. The question about effectiveness, justice delayed is justice denied. The question about the role of the players, of the actors in this process, and how we should build on experience of these five years. And I have a wonderful group of uh, speakers for this panel. First of all, Andrea Jelinek, who up to today, as you know, up to this morning, was the chair of the European Data Protection Board. Andrea has been pivotal to the success of the European Data Protection Board over the last five years. And uh, as much as the new chair will bring uh, with them the new set of experiences, we are sad to see Andrea go. Andrea is also the head of the Austrian Data Protection Authority, of course, and in this role, she will be also pivotal in the next uh, months and years. Next, we have Olivier Micol, 
who is the head of the data protection unit within the Directorate General for Justice and Consumers at the European Commission. You probably don't see him too often in Euronews, CNN, and uh, in the press, but I think I will not be far from true when I say that whatever you heard from the European Commission about the enforcement of GDPR went through the table of Olivier Michel as the person who is uh, this eyes, who, who creates this eyes of the Commission on the enforcement. We have Ursula Pachl joining us today, the Deputy Director General of BEUC, the European Consumer Organization. Uh, Ursula leads uh, BEUC's work on digital single market and on consumer rights, on redress and on enforcement. And she is a leading voice, not only for the consumer protection, but also for data protection in this very practical meaning of this word. And finally, I would like to welcome Herwig Hoffman, professor of the European and transnational public law at the University of Luxembourg. Herwig has litigated multiple times in fundamental right cases before the Court of Justice of the European Union including the Schrems cases. He also been a crucial voice in the academic narrative on GDPR. So this is uh, the group of the people whom I would like to ask the first very general questions. Question, what is the state of GDPR enforcement today? Andrea, tra trans transitioning out, uh, of the role of the EDPB chair, what are your reflections on where enforcement has gone the past five years? And given recent enforcement actions we have seen, do you believe that this enforcement landscape is shifting? Thank you, Wojciech. Thank you, Wojciech, for having me. Though I'm already uh, gone as the chair of the EDPB, it's a pleasure to be here today with you, Olivier, and Ursula, and Havik, and Wojciech for sure, to discuss a topic that has been up so much of my work, uh, especially in the last few years, especially during the last three years, because when the GDPR entered into application uh, at the day five years ago, uh, the expectations were quite high. The one were thinking, the ETPP, is supporting the future fining machines, and the others uh, were thinking, oh, this will be a toothless tiger. So I think uh, none of these both, uh, none of these two expectations were met. At first, uh, we, gave, we in the EDPP gave guidance and uh, opinions for the companies, for the organizations. We supported them in how to be compliant, though they already had to be compliant from the, day for, from the first day on. But we still gave them guidance and we're still doing. Um, with the years to follow, um, we changed from guidance uh, to um, either on the national uh, level and also on the ETPB level from guidance to enforcement. We created the support pool of enforcement, and we met in Vienna, as Wojciech already said. And it was really important uh, during the last two years, the national supervisory authorities um, issued fines about one, two billion um, euro. And only this week, you all heard about it, uh, not only at this conference, you heard it via the worldwide media, um, the Irish DPC issued a fine for 1.2 billion to Facebook. And I think it's really important to show and to see that though um, our, uh, our cooperation mechanism is cross-border, less than 1% uh, of the cross-border uh, decisions are going through Article 65 the dispute resolution mechanism. So we adopted nine uh, Article 65 decisions at board level, and uh, there were 711 cross-border decisions made by the national supervisory authorities after uh, consultation, after working close together. 
And I think this shows uh, that the day-to-day -day work uh, is, is done, it's functioning on large-scale cases and also on the smaller cases. And at the moment, we are working on about uh, 1,650, I think, cases uh, in, together in cooperation in the case registers. Uh, you must imagine it can be that only two supervisor authorities are concerned, then only two uh, supervisory authorities are cooperating. But it can be up to 27 and even more 30 because the EAA countries are also part of the one-stop shop mechanism. So you see, um, it's possible that 30 uh, countries are working on one decision and even in this case, we only have nine Article 65 decision made by the board. And these decisions were then followed by the decisions, by the final decision of the lead supervisory authority. I think it really works quite well, but as you already said, um, one always can improve. And you already mentioned the Vienna meeting and the commission took our wish list on board to overcome some hurdles. And I'm happy uh, that the Commission took this on board. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. And it's also true that uh, the Vienna meeting uh, created not only the wish list, but also the very practical uh, uh, actions of the EDPB itself uh, uh, on cooperation. And uh, European Commission is observing that, uh, but it's actually not only the, the uh, guardian of the treaties, uh, but uh, has also the quite starring role in narrative on GDPR enforcement. So. Olivier, what is your assessment of current developments? Uh, how do you envision the results of the Commission proposal? Uh, how, how do you think it will work on procedural harmonization? And will it help to ensure the national DPAs can cooperate effectively in all supervision and enforcement cases? Thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, Wojtek, uh, for this uh, invitation to this great panel, and especially sitting uh, with such uh, distinguished speakers, and in particular, Andrea, given the record uh, at the uh, chair of the, of the EDPB. Um, I think today's discussion is, is indeed very interesting because, as you recalled, we had the announcement of what uh, quite a number of people would think is a, is a very substantial uh, enforcement action, 1.2 billion. I mean, for most uh, of companies, it's still a, a, a reasonable uh, amount. But it has triggered, paradoxically, um, a kind of reflection uh, with some commentators coming and saying, well, it's too little, it's too late. By the way, the Data Protection Authority were not agreeing between each other. We have to go to the uh, dispute resolution mechanism and the uh, Article 65. So in fact, the situation is bad. And it was a bit of a, of a surprise when you put the factual elements with the comments. And I think we have to take a step back. We are all, of course, very eager to see data protection progress. We are all very eager uh, and we should never be complacent uh, on, on our action globally. But I think we have to see, and Andrea just recalled uh, the, the figures, huh? uh, how data protection authority, how national uh, authorities who used to work separately are now working together. And you move from the national stage with different powers, with different approach, different philosophies, to a system which is putting uh, basically all the authorities together. So this was an initial comment that we are not, uh, you know, wiping uh, ourselves all the time and, and crying, but we have at least, you know, to see uh, the, the glass with half uh, full. On the GDPR implementation enforcement, I think currently there are two main issue, and one is a bit forgotten, which is how to integrate all these GDPR rules, all, all these data protection rules, into all these digital initiatives. Huh? You mentioned uh, some of them, the, the DMA, the DSA, the Data Act, 
artificial intelligence, but also platform workers, uh, health data space, um, uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence. And I think this is a big part, a big part of the success of the GDPR, is to permeate into all this legislation to ensure that data protection is a stepping stone for all this legislation. And then it creates, of course, the issue of governance that we can discuss later on. But if we look at the enforcement in the strict sense, the enforcement by the uh, uh, data protection uh, uh, authorities, I think that a lot of criticism um, which has been made recently, um, in fact, uh, 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 you know, uh, the time it takes, for instance, to come to uh, 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 a decision. When you think about the complex cases, and Andrea recalled nine of them have, have gone through the Article 65 procedure, touching on the completely novel issue, touching on the business model, of big companies, of big tech multinational in particular. If you compare that also to the time it takes, for instance, to the commission in competition cases, I mean, it, we are talking about, about years. So it is normal, it is normal that it takes time. It is normal to go to Article 65 procedure on such big cases where you have 27, 28 data protection authority uh, involved. So it is normal that we see the system working as it was planned uh, with the uh, 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 resolution, the dispute settlement uh, uh, resolution. And what we see also is uh, many of these cases, many of the, uh, uh, of the fines, whether for big cases, small cases, they are of course uh, appealed in court. So it is all the more important to have a robust uh, uh, legal uh, uh, decision. So to sum up, now we are in a situation where we have all these uh, uh, elements uh, in place. We see all the guidelines which have been adopted by the EDPB, but very importantly, the growing number of judgment by the Court of Justice. Only my unit last year, we dealt with contribution to more than 30 preliminary rulings, touching on compensation, uh, touching on the uh, 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 data retention, etc. So, yes, uh, a lot is, uh, is there. You mentioned, and I would like to probably in the second round go more into what we intend to do as a commission, but it's a, it's a, we, we can achieve a lot of progress still, but we have to see, you know, um, that we have achieved, and the DPAs and the Secretariat of the Board has already achieved Quite, uh, quite a lot there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, now, going to the point of view of those for whom the data protection regulation was pre pre prepared. So, the persons uh, around. I, I'm not saying, I'm usually also biased as the data protection authority to look from the point of view of well working administration, well working administration helping the people, or the procedures that we have to achieve, the ways to harmonize the law. But then I have uh, the meetings with my theoretical main allies, which, uh, which are the uh, organizations representing consumers. And uh, Ursula is the person who has always the numbers in hand and always the cases, the practical cases uh, uh, to present. So tell me how it looks like uh, from the point of view of the organization which has uh, such a long 60 years uh, uh, tradition of helping the consumers and uh, coordinating the work uh, of the organization to help it around Europe. Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you for your kind introduction, Wojciech, and, and for having the opportunity to follow up on our discussion last year uh, on enforcement in the digital world. Uh, I'd like to make, uh, in this first round, quickly three points. So, um, what have we achieved? What is the progress? What is the situation? And what are the challenges that we see in, in the future? And trying to, to give you this people-based um, perspective. So first, let me really also say some acknowledgement in the sense that we have seen quite uh, 
some progress. We have seen important cross-border decisions that has happened uh, with Monday's decisions, with the Amazon decisions. We have seen some increase in the resources of DPAs, which has always been a big issue, no, notably with Ireland, but there is still too many jurisdictions with not enough budget. We have seen the EPD, EDPB making really very big efforts uh, to promote um, greater cooperation within the network and um, to issue different guidelines, uh, internal documents, work program, the Vienna Declaration, the wish list for the procedural, for the pro procedural um, uh, legislative initiative. So really very, very good work. And I would like to commend also the EDPS for driving this uh, enforcement discussion forward. And we have uh, also, just to mention it, we have a new directive which will become applicable in exactly one month, which is the Representative Action Directive, which will give the right uh, to, for example, consumer organizations, but also other civil uh, rights organizations to go um, and launch injunctions, but also compensation action in case of infringement against the GDPR, and I think that will be very interesting. So big progress, or let's say important steps. But on the other hand, I think um, what I would like to say is we need to also see what happens in reality. So what is a reality check? And I have to say, I've, he I've heard a lot about statistics in the past two days. So a lot of figures about how many cases, how many decisions, how they have been treated. What does it mean on the ground? What does it mean for people? I mean, have we achieved what we wanted to achieve when the GDPR was putting into place? I think one of the most important objectives, at least from our point of view, was to change the business practices of the big tech, to change what is going on, to change this permanent exploitation, unfair uh, misuse of personal data. And I have to say, I don't think we are there yet. I think we are far away from having achieved that objective. And so there is an increased need to continue these efforts. And also, we know we have these big fines now. As I said, the second record holder is the Amazon fine of last year. But what is happening? There will be judicial reviews. I just checked it on the internet, Amazon. Uh, the decision is from last year. The first hearing uh, on the appeal is in January 24. So we are losing sight of all these big decisions because what we need to see is what, what is their impact. And I've, I'm afraid uh, we will have to concentrate on a situation where there is still the country of origin principle, which definitely serves the companies but does not serve the data subjects. Uh, we will deal with a situation where Ireland has to take decisions for the majority of these big cases. And we hope that really there will be improvements coming now, at least a little bit with the procedural harmonization initiative, but it will be very obvious. I mean, it is very obvious that this will not uh, solve uh, the problem. And, um, and let me maybe, as a last point, just say, this is not all, of course, because what is coming our way are, I think, even much bigger problems when we look at the situation of the new legislative acts that are currently coming out of the, if I may say, machinery. Uh, we have uh, very diverse enforcement architectures. We have big overlaps, maybe, DSA, DMA, Data Act, Data Governance Act, AI Act. Uh, I hope, and we've seen already moving away from the country of origin principle, which I think is very important, but how these different systems will be able to cater for the protection of people, for the protection of the fundamental rights, that we will not end up in a situation where nobody will be responsible because everybody is responsible. I think this is a big challenge of the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Hervik, uh, from the administrative law perspective, uh, how do you see uh, the overall distribution of powers in the data protection enforcement landscape, and uh, uh, including the role of complainant in the, uh, in the procedure itself? What are your thoughts on the direction we are heading with it? Well, thank you very much. Um, I can only agree with uh, everyone that five years GDPR 
is a very important milestone to think because it's exactly at the moment where there's an explosion of new legislative activity, information and data related in the broader sense uh, with lots of inconsistencies potentially coming up. But the five years of GDPR have also taught us a lot. Some successes, obviously, but uh, it's also time to take a critical review of um, what can be improved, because that's, after all, what we're always looking for. Huh? Where, where can things become better? And already for observers, uh, when the GDPR was created, um, from its very conception, it was the GDPR was infamous for its complexity, the level of composite enforcement, where you had all kinds of elements together. And the first cases we've had and we've seen so far show that there are quite a few problems uh, exactly in this concept. Um, uh, problems with regard to complaints and complaint handling, problems with cooperation between levels and responsibility taking for decision making, uh, and also uh, problems with the uh, Commission's approach to adequacy decisions. Uh, we shouldn't forget that. That's another component of the GDPR which, which is there. And uh, forgive me for looking at problems. The reason I'm looking at problems is to learn of what we've had from the first few years. If you think of the complainants and the complainants' role, um, that is very different and very diverse throughout the European Union. Um, much more harmonization of procedural norms are necessary because it starts with questions of admissibility, which can be very different. It starts with questions of how can uh, complaints be submitted. It then goes on with the questions of what is actually the scope of an investigation? Um, can the lead authority limit a scope? Who actually identifies a scope? Uh, and We've seen many difficulties in, in those contexts. Uh, individuals are supposed to have rights to an effective judicial remedy, which means also uh, uh, procedural rights beforehand. Um, so the GDPR tells us quite explicitly. But there is a move of taking a complainant more and more as an informant and not as an active party to a procedure. There in that context, um, I think we have a lot to learn from areas where there is a two-tier system, where big transnational cases are handled on the European level or by European agencies, and smaller local cases are handled locally. Um, that was an approach with banking supervision, for example. Um, it is, to a certain degree, the approach of the DSA. And uh, we should definitely think of doing and going in the same direction in the context of the GDPR, because it makes a difference whether we're talking about a church community having a data protection issue or we're talking about a company like Amazon or others. Um, so in this context, uh, we, we really have to uh, think about um, large cases uh, to be handled differently than small cases, not least because of the problem of agency capture. And uh, we know that member states are in competition with each other for attracting investment, uh, and data economy is getting more and more importantly. So there is a certain risk of agency capture by industry and politics. Uh, and we've, we've seen that to a certain degree in the conflicts which had gone to the EDPB in the Article 65 process that there was a very different approach. Um, and uh, the outsized role of the lead authority in the moment uh, leads also to many different approaches. For example, if an agency prefers informal handling of complaints and informal discussions with companies, Often, the complaint handling is then short-circuited. The one-stop shop doesn't work because the information doesn't come through. You know from the EDPB very often that it's extremely difficult to work with a file which has been brought to you by a national authority, which is simply not complete because the national authority has decided to limit a case uh, before even it could come up to the... Uh, to the, to, the, to the European level. So there we have to think about many things, but the solution cannot be um, uh, to simply say the complainant is an informant and after he's submitted his complaint, that's all the hearing and all the access to documents, rights, and so on we're giving. Because if you look at the, the idea of the EDP, uh, GDPR, uh, it very strongly focuses also on NGOs who can collectively represent individuals. And that's a very good thing because an individual will not have the time, the knowledge, and uh, the means to go against such big companies as we have them. Just one last word. I can't um, avoid that. You know, the big case we're talking about, the Meta case right now, which after 10 years led to a decision by the, the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, um, 
will now probably be for many years also in courts again. But let's not forget that it took two preliminary references to the Court of Justice. In the Court of Justice, the Court of Justice, absolutely unheard of, twice said that the Commission had violated not just proportionality issues, but the essence of the right to an effective judicial remedy, and once the right to uh, privacy and data protection. And that is quite stark. I think we should also consider whether it wouldn't be a good idea to have, like in certain policy areas, an independent agency prepare adequacy decisions, which the Commission then would have to take over. Uh, I know that's not been discussed so far, but um, we definitely have a problem here, especially when we're looking at what is being suggested in the moment as the third um, adequacy decision with regard to the United States. OK, thank you. I think that the adequacy decisions uh, will rather go to another part of the discussion uh, on the uh, experiences uh, from GDPR, because they are not that much connected with enforcement. So uh, but going back to, to Andrea and uh, to the question about experiences uh, that uh, you had, I have the two questions, actually, at the same time. The first is, what will be your uh, most important message and most practical message that you will want to send to the new chair of the DPB and what will be the things that you want, uh, want to tell her to be um, aware of and uh, uh, careful about? Do you want to t t tell us uh, about it? And, and the second thing, do you, do you see a kind of a shift in your point of view when you will be looking at the work of the EDPB only as the uh, data Protection Authority on the national level, of course the member of the EDPB, but now not uh, necessarily also the, the solver of the problems in the EDPB. Thank you, Wojciech. Thank you also, Wojciech, for these questions. Uh, my advice uh, for, the, for the new chair, I already told her, uh, not only in private, but uh, in, in front of all of the supervisor authorities, trust on your colleagues and trust on the secretariat, then uh, the job will be easy. Because your colleagues with who you are going to cooperate and uh, the secretariat, you can rely on them. You can rely on their support and what they are uh, doing with you. And the new chair is not ex at all unexperienced. Anu Talus has a long, long standing experience in data protection. So I think, uh, uh, in general, she doesn't need any advice. Uh, but that's uh, regarding the first question. The second question, um, as Ursula said, uh, what about the people-based uh, perspective? Uh, as head of the Austrian Supervisory Authority, I can tell you we have more than 2,000 complaints a year. And we're dealing with each and every complaint very seriously and our complainants are not informants. They are part of the, of the process. They are part of all what we are doing, including right to be heard, it's quite clear. And I think uh, we already changed a little bit the behavior also of the big companies uh, because they have to apply and it is quite clear, uh, as you said, uh, it will, all of these big uh, fines are going to be challenged. Yes, that's normal, you know this. That's normal in democracies that these, um, these decisions are going to be challenged and it will be up to the court to decide on them. And regarding the scope of the complaints, uh, the European Court of Justice uh, is going to decide also on the scope because we issued, um, the European Data Protection Board issued um, a decision and the Irish DPC had to follow it, and this contains also the scope, and it will, it is already at the court. But in democracies, things are lasting longer than in other forms of government, and I'm happy that we are living in democracies, though uh, it can take longer time until we have certainty. But if you look back uh, at the last five years, uh, five years ago, uh, we didn't have we didn't know how it, it will work out. It was important for us to raise the awareness of the people that they can get 
their rights, that they have to go to their national supervisory authorities, even if it takes long, uh, even if it takes long, because uh, cross-border investigations uh, sometimes really take time. You all, we all agreed uh, that um, thorough investigations take time and that these cases are complex. And in the less complex cases, it also takes less time. And I think uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, even if from a consumer perspective, it's always too slow, it's always not good enough, uh, we have to acknowledge that a lot of achievements have been made. You already mentioned it, especially regarding not only the guidance, but all what the board has done and all what the national supervisory authorities have done on national level and not only on cross-border cases, because some of us were not even able to take decisions before the year 2018, and they had to adapt. And they had to use their powers, their new powers. And I think, uh, if, I, if I look back, where we have been five years ago, and where are we now, uh, though uh, nobody is always confident, I'm just a little bit proud that the supervisory authorities really made their path. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ursula, you were you spoken before, especially uh, during the conference a year ago, about the need of interdisciplinary uh, enforcement. Uh, do you think that any progress uh, has been made in this field? Uh, and uh, do you still advocate for the, its uh, relevance in the broader context of the enforcement landscape? Yeah, thank you. Let me just, if you allow, briefly yes, answer to, to Andrea, because I think this is very uh, a very important question uh, about that everything takes time and that the cases are complex. Um, what I wanted to say with um, my uh, members' experience, for example, so we have brought in November 2018 a case that we think is a very strategic case, which was about the location data that Google gathers on the Android phones, right? And you know that millions and millions of people use Android phones. Uh, we brought it because we think it is very necessary that there is better protection and that there are different business practices in that regard. Uh, November 2018, we have not seen the decision yet. So that makes two and a half years. And I think it's important that we are aware and we fully recognize that there is so much work being put in by the authorities, by everybody at the national level, at the European level. But the outcome is not satisfactory. With all the statistics that we have, we have to recall that we are not where we wanted to be and where we hope to be after five years. I think that is the point that really we should, we should not forget um, uh, to underline here and today at this anniversary. Um, there is still a lot that needs to be done. Uh, to your question, Wojciech, about the interdisciplinarity. Um, yes, very important, and I would say even much more important than we thought maybe um, one year ago. It's becoming increasingly important. We have seen some, some baby steps, if I may, may say. Uh, yesterday we uh, had a panel that uh, I moderated where there was the chair of the EDPB task force on the interdisciplinarity between consumer law, data protection law, and competition law. So these are very good signals. But after all, we have still old structures uh, in terms of the silo approach, data protection, consumer law. There are some informal meetings between the two networks, as far as we understand, but there is no legal framework that would organize the cooperation, which would be very, very necessary. Um, we have brought cases to the consumer protection authorities that should also have benefited from the opinion of the data protection authorities, but we understand it's not possible, mainly because there is confidentiality restrictions and that there is no framework in place that would allow the sharing of information and would allow sharing of exchanges. And that is a real pity. It leads us to a situation where Biuk brought a complaint against WhatsApp for changing their privacy policies in a way that we thought was a very aggressive practice under unfair commercial practices law because they pushed their policies out. And uh, if um, users wanted to uh, use the service of WhatsApp, they first had to agree to the new privacy policies before they could use the service clearly from an unfair commercial practices point, uh, uh, not um, 
not uh, compliant. Uh, the result of this uh, was that um, after nearly two years, the CPC authorities decided um, that um, that um, that was not okay. But next time, WhatsApp should make uh, make it better. And there was no involvement of the privacy uh, data protection uh, and data protection authorities um, to to understand uh, maybe what the effect was of this uh, imposition of the new file. So just to say, this would have been one example where we really wanted to see more progress. Um, and we are currently, as I said before, we are creating new structures without having this framework in place about these new enforcement structures, again, DSA, AI Act, Data Act, how they can work together, uh, and what would be necessary in order to have exchange of information and coming to um, exchanges about what remedies uh, could be put in place. Um, and yes, I mean, this is something where we would expect the new commission to really put something forward, hopefully, because I think we're going into a direction of centralization of enforcement. This is unavoidable, also in the direction you pointed out, Herrick. Otherwise, for the big cross-border cases, for the big EU-wide cases, there will be no other solution for effective enforcement. I think this is a reality, and we have to face it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, that was a decision. Uh, that was taken at the very beginning of the discussion about uh, uh, GDPR, that 99% of the cases are not n even national, they are local. So that's why they, they should be uh, solved uh, as uh, close as possible to the, uh, to, to the place where, uh, the, where they happened. Uh, but uh, uh, I would like to uh, ask, going to the Commission now, I would like to ask uh, uh, what are your plans uh, for this Commission College. So what can be done now in this term of the Commission and also this term of the Parliament? And what will be the role of the review to, to, to be done in 2024? Uh, are you going to propose some further solutions uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the enforcement environment? Point. I mean, just to highlight also the the fact that the, the important attach by the Commission on the monitoring of the GDPR. Huh? If you compare to many legislation, you have a regulation. You look five years after how it goes. Here we are having meeting with the DPA two, three times a week. Uh, we are having discussion with stakeholders, with uh, 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 civil society, uh, with companies, etc. So this is important to stress that to say that okay. I mean, we are on a daily basis dealing with enforcement implementation. Um, and just to um, uh, mention, why did we choose this approach of this enforcement? And this is linked to the forthcoming commission uh, proposal. Because we have this principle of proximity, that it is a national data protection authority close to the citizen, who is the entry point. Uh, and at the same time, we have this EU level, in a way, centralization or this uh, uh, work between uh, the data protection authorities in the context of the EDPB with a dispute a resolution mechanism. So we have this EU approach. We have this EU approach already. So now the key point also mentioned by, by uh, uh, Ursula and uh, Ervik to, to some extent is the articulation with this other legislation. And then it is very important that all what is data protection is dealt with by the Data Protection Authority and the European Data Protection Board. And this is what, in the Commission proposal, we have tried to do and that we try to maintain also throughout the interinstitutional negotiation. There was, some weeks ago, this first meeting of the high-level group on the DMA where the EDPB and the EDPS is fully represented involving competition authority, consumer authorities, etc. So this is indeed, this cooperation will have to be fostered, but it will have to be fostered also between labor authority and data protection authority when we talk about the platform worker. And you can go on for all this other piece of legislation. Now, how to make this system even more efficient than it is now? 
Um, indeed, there was this list from the uh, ADPB that we very much welcome. And by the way, this was an issue we already identified in the 2020 uh, Commission report on the application of the GDPR. So uh, it's quite unusual, and I want to strengthen that, that you have all enforcers together unanimously, so to quash a bit also this narrative about fights between data protection authorities who would stab themselves in the back uh, in the corridor. What we see on a daily basis, and we do not agree, as a commission does not agree sometimes with what the DPAs are doing, but this, uh, at least, you know, this cooperation on a daily basis. And I think sometimes we have a bit of a distorted view of the uh, reality. Um, and most of the case, there is uh, full uh, agreement. So what we want to do indeed is to address a number of issues. You mentioned uh, having some of them, uh, uh, Ursula as well, and also uh, uh, civil society, business have uh, also brought that to our views. How to harmonize the involvement of the complainant in the cross-border cases. Indeed, this is something we have to look at. Um, also to give them the same opportunities in the procedure to uh, express their views to guarantee the due process uh, right, so that the parties under investigation, so the controllers, uh, the processors, are having procedural guarantees which are similar to those in criminal proceedings, in line with uh, uh, the case law of the Court of Justice, to set up a number of deadlines. And this we have to be careful also, because complex investigation, you cannot say in two months you have to achieve this result. This is completely unrealistic, but we can and speed up uh, uh, some of the procedure. So, and what is very important is that at the end of the day, the decision is a robust one, is a legally robust one. Because you, sometimes the most vocal people, they are not the one going to defend the case in court. And, uh, uh, you know, it's very easy, um, uh, you know, to sit on chair and say, well, it should have gone quicker, the fine should have been bigger, it's obvious this and that, but when you are in front of the court, this is a, 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 a different thing. So this is really what we are, are trying to do uh, with this uh, proposal, um, uh, and indeed we engaged again a lot with uh, uh, stakeholders, um, and we wanted to do that as an anticipation of the forthcoming evaluation in 2024, because this is the end of this college uh, uh, next year, the end of, this, uh, of the parliament, and if you wait, uh, uh, basically it postpones everything by a number of years. So because of this urgency, because of the request of the, of the board, we decided to act quickly. I can tell you a scoop already, when we will publish the proposal, nobody will be happy. By definition, well, by definition, nobody is happy with what the commission does in general. And if you have people disagreeing, you put a commission official, they will all agree against the commission official. This is a way to, to bring peace in the world. But um, here, we will try to take on board the elements brought by the, by the, in the wish list probably not all of them, without amending the GDPR, because if you amend the GDPR, if you change it, you need a very um, big process. And we don't think it is the right thing to do now. You also have to realize that if you open the GDPR, the result might not be the one you are looking for. And I think it's a very important element. And this we hear both from civil society, from business, from data protection authorities, um, the majority of them is that we have to make the system work. We should not change drastically the system now. Um, and this is really our endeavor. This is really what uh, uh, we, we have to, to, to do. And it's not only also a question of law, it's a question of spirits. Huh? You have to also, and we saw this that between the data protection authorities, progressively there is this common EU spirit, I would say, from different national authorities which are being created. It doesn't mean that everything is rosy, not at all. Again, I don't want to, you know, um, to be accused of painting a completely uh, uh, rosy picture of the reality, but we have to concretely identify the issue and to try very practically to address them. And this is what we will try to do with our proposal, which is likely to come before the summer beginning of uh, July or something like that, if everything goes well, subject to the political 
um, uh, uh, agreement. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Helvig. And uh, what is your uh, vision for the next years? Uh, what are the things uh, that remain uh, uh, to be done in the uh, current model? And uh, are there any lessons uh, to be drawn for, from administrative law point of view? Uh, that you believe will be applicable in the future environment? Well, um, one point I would like to mention, which we haven't mentioned so far, is the ratio between private and public enforcement. Um, this has gone there and back in various national uh, courts and before the Court of Justice, and there, if I might characterize a bit, was a tendency of public enforcement to say, well, you can always go private, so don't bother us, and of, you know, private courts always saying, well, uh, stop it, you can always go and complain with a data protection board and, uh, or uh, authority and, and they you're, you're, you're good. And, uh, I, you know, I think the pendulum is swinging a little bit to having public enforcement as the main default enforcement. Uh, I would interpret Österreichische Post from last week a little bit um, like uh, the fact that since uh, damages under the GDPR are non-punitive, and proof must be brought of the relation between the violation of the GDPR and the damage that that means in principle, enforcement is more on the public side. And that of course puts pressure on the public enforcement authorities, which with limited resources have to make certain selection of, of priorities. There's, there's no question about that. But how to do that smartly, I think is the, is the key issue we have to, to look into. Um, because we have various elements, uh, powers we can harness. Uh, it, in the, you know, one extreme is to go and say we have purely investigative procedures where a complainant puts in a complaint and then it's only the body. We, however, have very good uh, NGOs and, and consumer protection. And uh, thank you also, Osla, for mentioning the new directive. Uh, those things are very important. And I think one could also imagine moving more into an adjudicative procedure where the, the collective representation of consumers or of complainants has a stronger role in a procedure. Um, uh, that is, those are models which exist and could be very well used to uh, make the system better and, and more powerful. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's a good moment uh, to ask for the questions uh, from the audience. I can see a lot of people here who, who commented uh, uh, GDPR and its enforcement uh, for last month. And uh, I think uh, our friend, uh, we have the first question here, here in the first row. Oh. <laughs> uh, Petra Purvan, my name. Um, I am a compliance lawyer, data protection educator. I would have a question for the, uh, for the former chair of the EDPB. Um, so in January, um, the Irish DPC announced two fines against uh, Meta, one in relation to processing of personal data in the context of Facebook, one in the context of Instagram services. And at that point, um, in a press release, um, DPC, the Irish DPC also stated that EDPB has um, a came over and above, above its mandate to um, um, uh, 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 issue a decision in a, in a dispute resolution situation. Uh, so they have criticized the EDPB and also they have announced that they will take legal action, which I think they did meanwhile. So my question is, do you feel like EDPB has indeed crossed its mandate, the line, with advising the extension of the investigation? And is the tension between the Irish DPC and the supervisory authorities, um, are, are those tensions so deep as we, the public, perceive them, or it's not so bad? Thank you for the questions. Let, let me, let me uh, intervene for just a second. And to say that uh, the decisions of the DPB are often taken by the majority. And the fact that the people have different points of views is nothing strange and nothing uh, original. And uh, the actions uh, that are taken against uh, the EDPB are not the actions of the individual uh, data protection authority against all the others that are uh, sitting there. So uh, for these reasons, uh, sometimes it's hard to comment it uh, as the fight of two 
the binary solutions. Thank you, Wojciech, for taking the question. Uh, you, you already answered. No. Uh, yes, and, and it, was a, it was perfect like always. But the point is, uh, what uh, the Irish DPC has done is quite an ordinary thing. It's uh, a part of the GDPR. That's the first issue. The second issue, I don't know which fantasies uh, people have what we are doing. Uh, we are looking sometimes on the same legal problem from different aspects, from different point of views. That's what we are doing uh, in a respectful way. And um, I, I, don't, I really don't know what you are thinking, what we are doing uh, in our plenary meetings. We are discussing in a respectful manner. And sometimes we agree to disagree, but it's all this is normal, and, it's, uh, and in the GDPR, it's foreseen how to act if one authority is not confident with the decision of the majority. So I think it's not so. It's 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 not so famous. It's not so uh, so so such an issue. What what you're thinking? I don't know what you're thinking. We are doing. I don't know. But these questions come over and over again. So I, I really would like to know what you are thinking, what we are doing when we are discussing our legal files. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are the, there's a microphone already there. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please go uh, on. Hi, I'm Maria Magierska from European University Institute in Florence. And I have a question uh, for Professor Hoffman. Uh, but also, please, so other panelists will come to answer as well if you have, if you want to contribute. So you mentioned that there are lessons from the, uh, to be learned from two tire procedures that are already existing, and you mentioned uh, banking supervision and DSA. Uh, so my question is, how do you imagine this with the GDPR? How, who should take care on, uh, for enforcement on this European level, knowing that the, both the treaties and the charter mention independent authority? Uh, also on the European level, meaning independent also from the Commission and other authorities, of course. So I was just curious, how do you imagine the centralized model? So, thanks. Well, um, first of all, we know the, the history of the EDPB was, was a little bit uh, fraught and, and sort of a middle ground has been created in the GDPR. Um, yes, it's an independent legal person, but uh, you know, not quite an agency, um, and especially not equipped like an agency with, with uh, tools, personnel, and procedure. No, the, what we have to think about is um, one-stop procedure. Isn't it possible actually to complain against bigger entities directly to a European level, so that the European level would then take it up? And we have one procedural order, which is the European procedural law, and not the mix of various. And the mix of various procedural orders you know, be it from access to documents or hearing rights and so on and so on, give a lot of the practical problems in reality, and those are many of those we see in the courts. Um, this would, of course, also require that a European-level body would have own investigation rights and possibilities. Uh, but I don't think that's a negative. I think that's a positive, and it should also, for bigger companies which fall in this category, be a positive, um, because they would have more legal certainty uh, faster. Uh, one of the big issues uh, for example, Meta was complaining and Meta's lawyers were complaining uh, about uh, the massive legal uncertainty they are facing because uh, of changing rules and so on. And I, I think um, the legal uncertainty problem is not just a problem for the individual complainants, but also for controllers. And uh, speed, one-stop shop in this context, procedural rights would be uh, more easily approached through that. Thank you very much. The young man in the second row. Um, I don't know if you can hear. Yeah. Um, so I have three questions. Um, first, for the Commission, um, we already heard during the you GDPR can say that. Moving, but um, you can also, hmm? uh, present yourself. Yep, I'll try to be short. Um, for the GDPR, we already heard that everybody's always going to be unhappy, and that's the way it is. Um, hopefully, we're going to work to make everybody less unhappy with the new regulation because I think that is what we want. And specifically, because you mentioned the right to be heard. What's the commission position currently on the right to be heard for citizens as well? Because it's quite amazing that companies are heard, um, but then the individuals that are actually concerned with their data, that are the holders of the fundamental rights, should less be heard, not be heard? First question. Um, second for, for Andrea, first of all, 
um, a deeply felt thank you for managing this circus as a director for the last five years in the way it is. Um, it's definitely not always easy, but um, also you're kind of on the stage for the DPA. So I also wanted to bring up on your, on your point before that um, it's complicated, it's technical, we know that, but for example, building permit is also complicated and technical and there are neighbors that are complaining and all of that is typical in procedures but we have to decide within six months, for example, in Austria, and that's doable in other areas as well. So what makes privacy so specific that we have in the NOIP statistic right now, 86% of cases that do not have a decision within a reasonable time frame. Um, and I think that's not, e it's e too easy to say it's just technical and, and the law is complicated. That's true for a lot of areas <laughs> of law. Um, that's that part. And then the last question for everybody that I have to get back on my screen um, is, yeah, one thing that on the enforcement part where really I think we have to work more is how do we get the general deterrence going? Because generally in society, we do not follow the law because we always get a penalty, but because we generally have a feeling of enforcement, we have a feeling of compliance. And that at least when we talk to companies or DPOs, we had at the beginning of the GDPR, but we lost to a certain extent over the last five years. We have that very much from DPOs that they said, I cannot convince my CEO anymore to put money into the GDPR. Where is the consequence? Where can I show this general deterrence and how could we get there? Um, I hope that's useful. Thank you very much. Andrea or Herwig? I thought the, the first commission. question was to, to Olivier, but I will, I will answer. I will start with the second uh, with the second question. Uh, Max, you said I was managing uh, managing the circus. I really would I uh, would ask you um, to say, and really with all the respect, the ETPP is a European body which was created by three legislators, and uh, in circus. Uh, people are doing very important things, but I think I was not managing a circus. I was the chair of the European Data Protection Board, and I, I'm very honored that they had the opportunity to do this. That's the first issue. The second issue, <clears throat> um, as we are both Austrian, uh, we know that in Austria we have a time limit of six months to decide. And uh, you you. All, you also said about uh, construction rules. That's one of my examples I always bring, uh, that, the, uh, that uh, the building rules are complicated as well. But I come back to what, what I always say. Uh, people, and especially companies, are able to comply with the building rules, but they always complain that they have to have legal certainty uh, regarding uh, data protection. Because data protection didn't come into the world 2018. In Europe, it came already in 1995. And if these companies would have been compliant with the data protection directive already since 1995, they wouldn't have any problem to be compliant with the GDPR in 2018. So uh, I, I don't feel sorry for those of the big companies who were not able uh, to change their model because they had years of time and uh, now they have now they are going uh, to change because it, it's obviously costing them money. Uh, that's one thing you didn't ask but I wanted to mention it. Second thing, you said 86% uh, percent of, our, of your cases of NOIP are not yet decided. Maybe it's also a question of how many cases you are launching. No, uh, just 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 joking, but the point is the point is I know that your organization is doing it for good sorry yeah 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 i I know that your organization is doing it for the good, but the point is you also have to recognize and you know this all the supervisor authority are working on national and also on cross border cases very thoroughly uh, on your cases and on all the other cases we are facing, because we are facing many other cases which are as important as the NOIP cases are. Uh, and uh, these people, but, but these people don't have your opportunities, don't have your resources. So, uh, and for me, it's really necessary and important that you're all as complainants on equal footing. I just want really you to ask to understand this too. Thank you. Uh, Commission. Thank you. Um, to reply directly 
to your question, we know, of course, that the situation is very varied between member states. And, and the situation of the complainant is the most difficult, not in the usual suspects that we usually mention here, where they are relatively in a good situation, but in other member states where the situation of complainant is just, you lodge your complaint, you don't hear, see you in five years, and no access to, no information. So, indeed, as I mentioned, we think that uh, through this proposal, we'll try to bring some harmonization on the position of the complainant and also at, you know, uh, in, uh, in the process, the suitable time where you can make your view known. So this is also something we are trying to achieve through the proposal. Uh, this, is, this is an objective. Um, just to complement also on the proposal, to reply also to the uh, question, uh, I think, uh, raised by the lady, uh, uh, the first question on the, um, the fact that we go to a dispute resolution mechanism, which is, as Andrea said, as I said, also a very normal thing, otherwise you would not have the mechanism already put in place. W what we are trying also to do with the commission proposal is to uh, foster even more consensus early in the process. It doesn't mean that at the end of the day you will not have a disagreement, huh? but we are trying to, uh, in a way, using the tools already uh, uh, foreseen under the, the GDPR, to have this consensus early. And the, one of the consequences would have probably less of this last minute trying to find a solution. And it would have also um, uh, also fostering this European spirit that I mentioned, that we identify the issue, we can work together, and also it will be probably at the end a more robust solution. So this is really something we are trying uh, uh, to do uh, 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 there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I guess there's another question somewhere there, yes? There's somebody already with the microphone. Hi. That's, that's on. Uh, Sui Lang Harris from Luminate. I have a question for the commission for the EDPS and EDP bead, the extent you're still representing the board, about access to justice. As the EU passes the new uh, DSA, DMA, and uh, further legislation to regulate big tech and um, other uses of data, there is this move, as Ursula said, towards centralization of enforcement. At the same time, it's not clear to me that there, it's not clear to me how the Commission is thinking about the access to justice for individuals, because with this centralization, there's potentially higher barriers for standing to challenge decisions by central authorities that might not serve the interests of the public. So how are these institutions thinking about the enforcement architecture of the new raft of um, data laws? Commission? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I, I fully grasp the, 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 the question, but to reply on this architecture, as was noted down before, um, the authorities in charge of data protection, they have to be independent authority according to the, to the charter. So when we, when we have this discussion about centralization and how it works together with the other act, I think we have to realize that this other act, none of them are specifically, have a, have a specific objective data protection. They have all other issues, contestability of market, the uh, sharing of, of uh, data, putting, creating a data hub for health uh, uh, data, uh, uh, um, governing uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, of course, they have a data protection element. These data protection aspects are dealt with by the data protection authorities. This has to be uh, very uh, uh, clear, and you have other authorities who are in charge of enforcing uh, these um, uh, other tools. Uh, sometimes it can be 
the member states, uh, in some instances, has the possibility to choose the data protection authorities as the enforcers. Sometimes with the DSA, you have a coordinating authorities who has to ensure the coordination between the various uh, uh, bodies. But I think it's, it's very important to keep in mind that we are not taking away responsibilities from the data protection authorities. We are not, um, I mean, all that this system of governance has to be put in place. It has to work. It will not be absolutely, I mean, a, a, a straightforward. As I mentioned already, the, the, the DMA high level group uh, meeting some uh, 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 time, I mean, uh, earlier. We have more and more cooperation between consumer, consumer uh, authorities, the CPC network, and data protection authorities. This is to be encouraged. This is to be supported. I think the Commission is very much pushing for that. So I think at the end of the day, um, for your data protection issue, you will always be able to go to the data protection authority, to your national data protection authorities. I hope it replies somewhat to your question. Uh, yes, but I think, uh, Andrea, do you want to join it as well? Uh, you asked uh, about the opinion of, of the board about the new legislation. Uh, we issued last year a statement uh, regarding this, all these, um, all these uh, pieces of legislation, and we were very critical in some aspects. And uh, uh, the statement you can find on the website of the European Data Protection Board, because what we really appreciate is. Um, that the GDPR is the fundament of all of these new legislative acts, but uh, the enforcement, in our point of view, is too fragmented. Thank you. Okay, Herwig, you wanted to uh, join as well? Yes, very briefly, because you were talking about the right to an effective judicial remedy and court protection of the rights which are in the GDPR and obviously also in the Charter. Um, and there it's very important to see how procedural rights in a procedure and effective judicial remedies are linked. So it's very important to keep individual procedural rights because many courts, not just on the European level, but also in member states, link access to court and standing to having had procedural rights and their potential violation. So procedure matters, um, obviously, um, especially for the, for the enforcement of, of substance. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, this... Uh ring which we heard means uh, the bell rather that we heard means uh, that we are getting close to the uh, finish of this uh, uh, to, uh, of this panel so i would like the, the participants of the panel to say in one sentence how the uh, current assessment of the enforcement looks for them and uh, what do they expect who starts one sentence. Everybody's looking at me, okay. Um, enforcement took up speed and it will evolve. It will get better and better also with the support of the Commission, with the support of all the colleagues. And I think uh, in five years, nobody will again speak about it has to be centralized because as you know, One Stop Shop is working and it's working quite well. Thank you. Okay, the other participants, the other panelists. I can go if you like. I, I would say this is all about the credibility of the GDPR and it's about the credibility of Europe as a regulator and as an enforcer and we are not yet there. I think the big challenges are ahead. And maybe just to add to the access to justice, the very first start and the obvious one would be to strengthen the procedural rights of data subjects. And this is what we expect from the European Commission because currently there is uh, not at all an equal balance between the defendants and the complainants. And I think that's really the starting point. We need better access to justice. We need to have the same rights for the complainants than we have for the defendants. From our own experience, I can only say this is not at all the case. Huge issues which admissibility, no mutual recognition, and a very different position and not an equal situation. So I would say that would be a good starting point. Sorry, it was a bit longer than one sentence. Thank you. Yes, I think um, 
the enforcement of the GDPR is really in question in the moment. We've had five years, of course, to start and to learn. But um, if you see how it is done in other jurisdictions with a stronger focus on damages and more easily accessible damages, that is one approach. In Europe, we have a public approach, and the public approach has to live up to those needs. Um, our composite procedures in the moment in the multi-level structure uh, are difficult. The cooperation procedures, uh, the most unproceduralized element, uh, and there is a lot to be done in that context. Um, I would wish that we have more responsibility taken as decision maker on the European level um, in order to also make uh, possibilities of judicial review for individuals more simple, uh, because that allows then directly a European level court. I want to add one sentence because the others are also speaking longer. I just want uh, to say uh, legal certainty will be important and it will be given by the European Court of Justice because at the moment 56 uh, files are pending at the European Court of Justice regarding the GDPR and I think this already is going to help. Thanks. And Olivia. I would say no complacency, of course, but to be very down to earth, practical, I know it's not sexy at all, but with the list, uh, for instance, sent by the enforcers, again, by all enforcers, looking very pragmatically how we address the issues. And no big statement, no big statistics, please, no tweet uh, about uh, e funny figures, but really concentrating on fixing and making the system work. This is really what we are trying to do. Very blunt, very uh, difficult task, and uh, as I said, uh, not very flamboyant, but uh, this is what we are uh, trying to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So exactly at the time uh, we finish the panel, let me thank the panelists and uh, join me with applauding them for their comments. Thank you for the participation in the, pa in the panel. Thank you for your questions, and uh, let's see what will happen.